All right, it is finally time for me to make a video that is well thought out and has examples. And going forward, this is what I want to do. What's always held me back in the past is that I don't really consume media, especially the popular kind. And I don't really like talking about the stuff I do watch. I used to think that maybe it was like a bit too self-centered to frame advice videos around the, like the things that I've written. However, it's probably a good idea because I actually know a lot about how my own work is structured and I'd probably give much better advice than trying to make things up on the spot, which always ends up being about cupcakes or whatever. And I also just don't want to dunk on other people's work, it's just not something I like to do. So I will be digging into like a bunch of my stories, uh, most of which are available for free on Webtoon, or they can be found on my online stores. Uh, my novel is even an audiobook, so you guys like hearing people talk, so that's a thing. Uh, you can buy most of my things on Amazon, but it's preferable for you to buy from like my itch.io store or my Etsy. Anyways, th things are linked in the description below. Regardless, I will be trying to explain things in ways that makes it easy to follow along without having to like read stuff. I've actually done something similar before in my videos about world building and magic systems and you guys like those and I like those. Let's talk about how to start a story, okay? That's what we're doing today. Uh, first and foremost, whenever you start a story, as in wherever you begin writing your story for the first time, like when pen hits paper for the first time, that's very unlikely to be the actual start of your story. Uh, it's very hard to pinpoint the perfect beginning of a story without seeing the full scope. In every example of my writing, I either changed the beginning, I kept the beginning but I didn't like it, or I did both. I changed it and I didn't like it. <laughs> if you haven't finished your story, do not worry about locating the proper start until you have done so. You need all of the pieces. Editing the structure of my stories is very much a puzzle and I need to be able to see as many pieces as I can. So then I can go about rearranging them, find what's missing. Uh, the first outline and or draft, depending, that's where you're trying your best to find approximately where all of your pieces go. Knowing structure can help, but it only goes so far. So why is it so difficult to decide on a starting scene? In order to kind of fully understand why your beginning is difficult, you need to understand arcs, right? I kind of want you, in general, to think about writing in the form of arcs, right? So a lot of you are artists on this channel, because I talk about all stories, but I definitely started in the comic direction. As artists, I'm sure you've come across the idea that everything can be broken down into simple geometric shapes. Learning circles, squares, ovals, triangles, that's the one. You know, simple geometric shapes, learning to draw those, and then learning to draw the 3D versions of those, such as pyramids, cylinders, boxes. Boxes are a big one. Learning those shapes is fundamental, and likewise, understanding arcs is fundamental, because every single thing, when it comes down to stories, it can be broken down into arcs. There's plot arcs, there's characters arcs, there's themes, question, answer, like so many different things are arcs. In order to identify an arc, you'll see like a point A, and then you'll see a point B. So if something is introduced and then appears again, there is an arc. Some arcs are going to be flat, some are short, and some are like the major arc, your entire spine <laughs> to your story, you know? So what makes placing your beginning so difficult is that this is the ultimate A point of your story. So many important things get pinned down at the beginning of your story. Like every significant setup begins in the first act and even more so the first section of the first act. So you got to keep that in mind. Like act one is built up of 
introduction, call to action, refusal of the call, acceptance of the call. And the most important two of those would be um, understanding introduction and inciting incident. And in this video, I'm going to be discussing the introduction. And later, I will break down the other pieces of Act 1, possibly, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I'm not setting up an A point here, you know. We'll see, we'll see, hopefully. The introduction is the setup of your story. It's where you lay down your groundwork, it's where you plant your seeds, it's where you make your promises to your reader. And it's honestly where I struggle most, especially the aspect of setting up normalcy, like what is normal in your story before you go about breaking it. I always forget to do that part. Um, in my earlier writing, I never really wanted to take time to explain things. I had a lot of interesting ideas, but I would skip to what was interesting to me, the inciting incident, and even now, I'm not really the type of writer who likes to slow down and figure things out, but I have definitely improved. The issue with going too fast and skipping your introduction, like, you're gonna see that in my examples, but basically without setting up your elements properly, you'll end up confusing your reader. You'll also make it very difficult for your reader to feel invested in your characters and your plot if you don't set them up. Like an introduction is where your readers invest in the story, where they place their bets or whatever, I don't know what investing is. <laughs> Like, the introduction is a challenging thing, because while you want to be setting these things up, you also still want to have an interesting, engaging, conflict, full, con <laughs> full of conflict and plot. And while you're setting things up, like, you want to understand what elements even need to be set up before the inciting incident, and you'll simultaneously be laying down all of this information while you'll also be trying to not overwhelm your target audience so frick it's hard and like i said your introduction is your number one point a however like i said i want you to think in arches right there's dozens upon dozens of like mini introductions that will happen throughout your story at multiple times like your first introduction is definitely your most difficult but you're always going to be setting these things up like every scene has its own introduction right because everything is built up of arcs so yeah you can't just scuff this this is something you need to learn across the board as a writer so become familiar with introductions point a's setups uh, the words kind of interchangeable they're slightly different but mostly i use them interchangeably right with all that i think it'll be a good idea to start getting into like um some examples because this is a bit heady right now so i want to talk about honey walls first because it is the first novel uh the first story i guess where i really got the hang of introductions i think maybe i will retcon this when i'm even better at writing <laughs> When I originally began writing Honey Walls, I started on what is now chapter 4, and funnily enough, that's actually where I would mark the end of Act 1 now, I think? Mmm, yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not as set on inciting incidents, and maybe I should be. Regardless, the introduction to the main plot occurs in the very first two scenes of chapter one. The introduction to the side characters plot occurs in chapter two as well as the majority of the inciting incident because uh, just like introductions, inciting incidents sometimes take a few scenes to incident out. Um, anyways, I'm going to be focusing on the main character for this and not going into chapter 2 or later scenes that are a little more close to the inciting incident. I'm also going to be skipping the prologue because that is a topic for another day. I'm going to focus on scene 1 and 2 of chapter 1. Those scenes are a lot more indicative of the types of first scenes that I'm talking about, the type of introduction I'm talking about, and they're a lot more difficult to write than the very beginning part of Honeywalls. I'll get into prologues another day, basically. Okay, so 
to keep you all up to speed, because I said I would, Honey Walls is the story of a transgender man who doesn't have a heart, and he learns that his mother has died, and he has to return to his old hometown, and when he does so, he lets his sister back into his life, and she enacts magical revenge, uh, some of which involves turning his girlfriend into a mermaid. It's a wild ride. A lot to set up, so I often talk about keeping your setup simple, keeping your scene simple, and introducing one major thing per scene so that you don't overwhelm your readers. And I don't think I've ever really gone into this an in-depth way that fully explains it, because I also tell you that your scenes should do double duty, and that is some conflicting advice, Bones. <laughs> In the very first scene, I think it's indicative of the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So before I get into anything about stolen hearts, magic, dead moms, like anything, I need to begin my introduction by introducing my main character. So to do this, let me give you an overview of kind of this, how the scene plays out. So our first scene centers around Ro, and he's sitting with his girlfriend Chris and her mother. Zelda, and they're holding a seance. A storm starts building up, and throughout the scene, Chris begins to have a vision of death and roses. Meanwhile, Ro is being like a complete putz and non-believer. However, Chris starts getting really upset about the vision. Ro interrupts because, you know, his girlfriend's upset and he doesn't want her to be upset. His girlfriend's mother is mad at him. So he gets kicked out of the room. He looks out the stormy window and he sees a ghostly image appear and he goes up to it and he tells it off and says, Sundu, leave me alone or something like that. I don't have it right in front of me right now. And he closes the curtains in the image's face. So that is the first scene. Okay, that's, you know, that's the plot. That's the framework that I've selected as my delivery mechanism for the information that I want the readers to learn. No, that I need the readers to learn. When you're conveying information in your story, in order for it to still have movement and intrigue and like a sense of direction, even if it's like the introduction, which tends to be a very stationary element, you know, it's setting up what's normal. You don't want it moving too much. It can still have a plot within itself. You still want it to be engaging. So like if we zoom out from this single scene and we look at the main plot, you can kind of see the main thing that I want the reader to understand and that's that Ro, our main character, does not believe in magic. That's like the number one thing. The very very first thing like I set up about his, about his character before like anything else is that he doesn't like fantasy books. He thinks that no one should believe in magic and this is like the number one arc of our story. It is the very very first point A. It is the most important thing, right? And that's the most important thing you want to do from the jump and that's like set up the main plot of your story. Like in paragraph one, we get the most important setup in the story. I repeat myself. Sorry, I got distracted. Alexa turned the lights out on me. So what follows from that first paragraph is that I begin introducing some like other key aspects and other parts of his life. Things that like will come up throughout the story and I give the more relevant information like more weight. Like aspects of his character that directly engage with like the plot of the scene. Like I give weight to that and I flesh out that. While a counter example is in the second paragraph I briefly mention like his mother's stories. I want to give his mother's stories like importance because they are important in the story. They're a really major component, right? But Rose's relationship with his mother is not needed for the plot to move on right now. I don't want to linger on it. It's just distracting. So I focus a lot on Ro's girlfriend Chris because his girlfriend is a psychic, as I have said, and it's very, very easy to build off of this and still keep the main focus of the scene in focus, which is establishing that Ro hates magic. And it's kind of a really like interesting way. Like it was interesting for me. I don't know. Like it's a fun way to do it because it's directly engaging him in with the thing he doesn't believe in. 
you know, it creates contrast. Um, it's very show, don't tell, I guess, would, would be what I'm saying here. And it also creates an arc within the scene where the information develops further, right? So they hold the seance, and I hint at a lot of interesting things, but I don't dig into them. There's the foggy vision that Chris has, and then there's like the mentions of issues with his heart, and like all of those things are really big plot ele elephants, really big plot elements, but I don't fully dive into them because it would clutter the scene or it would like undercut the intrigue, the mystery that I'm trying to build up with it. At the end of the seance, that would be the final example of that where where we move on to like the hook, the hook for the next scene, which is the interaction with the ghostly reflection person. With all of that said, I'm sure a lot of you are <laughs> wondering like, how do I even choose what is important? Like what is the main thing my scene should even be about? Like how do you choose that? What don't I dig into? This is all very vague bones. Yeah, it is. It's very case by case. But those are like important questions and they're very twofold. You first have to determine what needs to be shared. Uh, then you determine what shouldn't be shared. And focusing on that first question, to determine what needs to be known, you have to look to your next major plot point. And in the case of your introduction, that's always going to be your inciting incident. And sometimes in order to set up what you need for the inciting incident, you have to set up your setup that can sometimes determine what your scene is but if you're lost like look to your inciting incident and figure out what your reader needs to know in order to appreciate that in the case of honey walls the major elements are that i want to set up that ro is avoiding magic i want to set up that chris is ro's girlfriend that ro can see magical creatures so the introduction revolves around those concepts and i guess to what's the opposite of manufacture reverse manufacture this. The inciting incident with Ro is that a magical Ro shows up with a letter inviting him to his mother's funeral and he isn't having it and that's what I wanted to set up because in order for there to be conflict, in order for the reader to understand what's going on, we need to know Ro's opinions on magic and we need to know about his girlfriend because in the very next scene it involves him and his girlfriend so and there's no time in between to flesh out her character so introducing her before is important okay so that's what i do include now we move to the second half what don't i include any large element that i don't need right away because those things are distracting. When it comes to things you don't need to include, there's kind of three ways that you can attack this. The very first is that you withhold any information about it, ignore it, <laughs> this is too big buster, we're not bringing this up kind of thing, or you add them as flavor. And the final way that you can add things that you don't need your reader to know into your story, beautiful grammar. The final way is to add them as intrigue, as mystery. Examples of flavor, let's get into flavor first. So for the first scene, flavor would be the character of Zelda, introducing Zelda. Zelda isn't needed at this point, but the things that we learn about her are used to aid in setting up Rose's character, kind of what I was mentioning before. Like, because I want to bolster Rose's character, because I really want to delve into his dislike of magic, using Zelda as contrast is perfect for that. You know, flavor is information that adds to your scene's goals while also being useful in other contexts as well. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about having your scenes pull double duty. You want to add information, not because that is the information that you want your readers to get out, it's just a secondary focus that helps bolster the main focus. That's kind of like how foreshadowing works, where it feels like a natural extension of the scene while secretly sneaking things in. Like another example, a more subtle example than Zelda would be the second paragraph where we 
mention Rose Mother because it doesn't mean tons to the reader at this point. It just kind of adds flavor, you know? It, it just spices things up. World building is usually initially added like that. So that's flavor. Flavor is anything that will bolster what you've already got going on, but it is not the main focus of your scene. Intrigue, on the other hand, is something that stands out. They're kind of on a continuum though. They're not exactly completely opposite of each other. Because like with flavor, it's not directly related to your scene's main goal, but it does dovetail from it. For an even more powerful result, with your intrigue, you want it to work like you do with flavor and have it build up the main point of your scene. Intrigue is just stuff that stands out where you give your reader a momentary glance at something really cool and then you quickly set it aside to simmer. Un unlike flavor, it's meant to be kind of distracting and to stand out and to give the reader the impression that they don't understand something, but in a cool way. <laughs> you want to use intrigue in a way that's not distracting. And the ways that it becomes distracting is if you spend too much time lingering on it, or if you don't put it away neatly and naturally. You don't want it to overtake your scene. You don't want the question that intrigue poses to your reader to be more powerful than the information that they're learning, because then it steals the focus and becomes the main point of the scene. And intrigue is just very powerful, potent. Be very careful with it. And you want your characters to very quickly deal with it, put out that fire for you, while your characters aren't interested in it, your reader still is, if that makes sense. Or your characters aren't allowed to be interested in it. More on that later, I hope. So in the first scene, examples of intrigue, right? That is the ghostly image and the seance. They're, they're both mysterious, they suggest plot, they're big, they leave questions, but they don't take up the entirety of the scene. They both suggest plot, they need to be explained, but like if you could imagine if I focused too much on the seance, if I focused all my energy on the image in the window, the scene drastically shifts um, what it's about. Like as I was saying, like you, you need to look at things in arcs, right? So like if we step closer and look at the scene and the scene's arc, point A is where we start, where Ro is talking about like not believing in magic. And then point B is where we get to the ghostly image appearing. And in the midpoint, that's where Chris sees her vision. So you can really see how there is a build of information. So what we learn from Ro at the very beginning is that he doesn't believe in magic, he doesn't trust it. But through intrigue, we heat up the pot, so to speak, and we expand on the point. Because by the end of the scene, it's not that Ro doesn't believe in magic because it's silly. He doesn't believe in magic because he's actively avoiding it. The midpoint reveals that there is possibly something magic going on. You know, the seance is pretty legit, definitely suggests magical BS is afoot. And the end is like, yes, there is magical BS afoot. Ro is aware of it. He has a name for this ghostly image and everything, but he just doesn't want to deal with it. And that adds the multiple layers we need to understand Ro and his relationship to magic. And that's what the scene's about. That's how you keep the focus of a scene while using intrigue to suggest other plots. <laughs> and the way that scenes work, you know, while we're looking at them, like scenes have their own A's and B's. And the B at the end of your scene is the A for your next, and that's how you link them together, like trains. I don't know. I'm trying to think of something that isn't human centipede, guys. I don't know why that's the only thing I can imagine being linked together. <sighs> I'm broken. I'm a broken person. Uh, getting back, to, while we're talking about examples of intrigue, right? I was saying put away things naturally, right? You don't want to look at intrigue and then put it away for no reason. And by that, I mean it needs to have a textual reason for it to stop going on. In the case of Roe, 
shutting the curtains on Sun Tzu, this adds to his character, adds to what we're trying to get across in the scene. And though his reaction to it is unnatural for your average person's reaction to that thing, it adds things because it, for one, it, it opens some more questions and expands on Rose's character, but it also is a natural way to end things for that character. Like, like if we took a moment and imagined Ro as like a different character with something else we're trying to get across, if you have a magical seance happening and your character has no reaction or their reaction is discordant with how they would later react, that's where you start having issues with your intrigue. You don't want to put it away in a way that feels cheap or boring or doesn't make sense. You can't open up a surprise box and have no one react to it and then expect us to move on. That's what I mean, where you have to open your surprises and then put them away naturally as quick as you can. You have to shut the curtains on your cool mysterious plot events before people stare too much or get annoyed that we're not looking close enough. Let's hammer in some more points. Let's move to the second scene of chapter one, which is actually the second scene and third scene, because though there's no scene break between them, it's definitely two scenes, and there's a few ways that like you can tell that. The main one to consider is that they have different central points to them. Another easier way is that if you sliced through the middle of these two scenes, you could insert like another character scene and then easily move to the next one. But for pacing, they're attached together. This is all stuff that maybe one day I will get into as far as scene stuff goes. In fact, there's like another uh, interesting thing, I guess, is the first scene that we're looking at is a scene sequel which is a concept I bring up a lot in videos, and I'm sure I will dive into it one day, but uh, a scene sequel is where you take some time to examine large elements that were brought up in the sister scene or scenes. It's where you take a breather and can really expand on things, or expand on like parts that weren't the main focus and then make them the main focus now or to reiterate on a point because sometimes you make a point but things are crazy at the time and you really want to add emphasis to it and that's what a scene sequel is for. So the bulk of this first scene revolves around expanding the context for the vision that Chris had because like we were talking about earlier, like delving into the vision earlier would have been cumbersome, it would have broken up the flow, and like Rose's thoughts on death are very large and important, and they really need their place in order for them not to get lost, in order for us to take advantage of the, the little breathing space we have there brought up in this scene sequel. I'm losing my voice. So this scene, it reflects on a few things, but it's predominantly about exploring more of Ro's character. It introduces the fact that he's like transgender and some of his opinions on that, what other characters' opinions about that are, and there's kind of just a very subtle arc to the scene. Uh, the point A, the starting point of the scene, is Ro pushing away thoughts about the magical encounter he had at the window, and the point B is a new magical encounter showing up in the form of a talking crow. So the reason that I added the crow encounter, our third scene, is that I was having a lot of issues with test readers on earlier drafts. In earlier drafts, the crow first showed up at the inciting incident, and I was running into a lot of problems where people weren't understanding the magical rules. Yeah, they weren't understanding the rules of the magic, and then that kind of became an element that needed its own dedicated space. So like an important rule that needed to be understood is that only Ro can hear and see the magic. So before Ro talks one-on-one -on -one with the crow, I needed him to interact with the crow with someone else present. I chose before rather than after because I, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's better pacing and it's less distracting 
I guess that's that's a big part is it's less distracting to be introducing uh, a lot of Rose feelings that occur in his later crow conversation. Yeah, it's a lot less distracting if there's just a nice succinct scene to really hammer home that point. And yeah, that's the introduction to Honeywell's. Damn, that took a long time. I think the biggest takeaway from Honeywell's is kind of about the weight and importance of information. It's important to find out that Ro doesn't have a heart, but that's not set up in the introduction. His sister isn't really set up in the introduction because it's it's a lot of heavy, complicated pieces of information that aren't needed. You really want to find that core in order to bring your readers along with you. And yeah, setup doesn't end at act one. Setting up normalcy, that ends, but the setup in and of itself doesn't end until basically after the midpoint is when you stop doing major setup, or I guess, yeah, the midpoint is where I usually stop with major setup and you start watching like things fall into the place, but there's still going to be minor setup throughout, you know, continuity is set up at a much minor scale and scenes always are going to have set up, but majorly that stops around the midpoint. I guess the way you would phrase that is if we were to find out that Ro doesn't have a heart before the midpoint, then that is most likely going to be a A point, you know, a setup. Whereas if we found out after, it's usually going to be a B point. It's going to be a payoff for something that was set up earlier. And that's that. Time to move on to works I hate. <laughs> okay, let's talk about a time where I did a terrible job at making a beginning. This is like the worst beginning in my published work, I think. <laughs> Pretty mouth. Oh god. Okay. This story is gonna haunt me for the rest of my life, but we're gonna have fun here and we're gonna talk about what went wrong with Pretty Mouth introduction-wise. There's many other ways it went wrong. I also went ahead and made a better introduction to compare and contrast with maybe a little bit. Pretty Mouth is a story about a one night stand with a monster that goes awry. There's witches and stuff. Main character Evan is cursed and the other main character is a monster boy. That's Pretty Mouth. It begins with a prologue and it's a skippable prologue throwing it aside, just like with Honeywell's throwing that aside. So we're going to focus on what happens in the very first scene and what we learn from it, or at least like what the text is trying to teach us. So there's a character that has a hat, Evan, and there's a character with shades, Rizzo. They're making out and there's a stake there. Uh, Evan, our hat friend, is nervous and Rizzo has a monster tongue and Evan sees the monster tongue he's like ah but then he's like ah never mind it's fine there's growling underneath evan's shirt turns out there's something under there that eats the steak <laughs> evan has an extra mouth that's on his neck uh they make out with that mouth and that mouth has its very own personality it's it's a lot um i think that's everything that comes across I don't know, honestly, though, because there's so much going on there, and that is a major issue. You know what the beginning of Pretty Mouth doesn't do? It doesn't set up that this is our world, or at least close to our world. It's a contemporary setting. No, it doesn't set up that at all. Like, Honeywell's grounds itself very strongly in the real world, while still getting into the fantasy elements fast enough that it doesn't like throw the reader for like a crazy loop. It's fine to throw your readers for a crazy loop, but that wasn't my intention. There's a lot of consequences for throwing your readers for a loop and you should do that with intention. And I definitely did not do that with intention when I was writing Pretty Mouth back when I was a baby teenager, okay? The thing is like if Pretty Mouth was a complete 
fantasy world. If we were in like a fantasy world where monsters are the regular thing, curses are just regular everyday occurrences, like that would be fine. That would be a fine setup to have like a blase reaction to all of these things to just kind of roll with it like it's normal but that's not the case and what happens in the beginning of pretty mouth is what i was talking about with intrigue where it is not set aside naturally at all in pretty mouth evan discovers that rizzo has crazy monster face and then he just goes back to hugging him and stuff like there's no reaction to that even though Evan as a character wouldn't do that you know that's the plot forcing that to happen not a natural reaction Rizzo befriending Ramona like isn't out of the blue like that's fine but the Evan thing is completely out of the blue and even if the Rizzo thing was fine we haven't set up Rizzo entirely as a character either and it's just confusing and that's why you need to be careful with the intriguing stuff that you throw at your reader because it gets very overwhelming very fast because if you treat something like it is normal and you don't give an attention if you do that long enough your readers will take the text's word for things and start treating things as blasé and normal which is a good thing to know if you want to do that and also if you don't want to do that because it's it's much easier to set up normal and then go about breaking it than it is to break something before you've set it up and then put the pieces back together and show people like where we started it's easier to just show it break it then break it put it back together and show it i hope that makes sense it's kind of like Ro and his missing heart. Like that's a thing that needs to be brought up slowly with a lot of groundwork in order for it to be as impactful as I want it to be. If I wanted to fix Pretty Mouth, like a good place would be to start by looking at the end. Your A point is going to reflect your B point. You know, you start at a place, you end at a place. They are reflective of one another. So in order to determine the best possible beginning, we need to look at where we want to go, where we end up. And with Pretty Mouth, it ends with Evan stopping a witch that wants to kill a god. <laughs> that god's the god that cursed her, cool, and Evan gets uncursed. And all of this is predicated on him recognizing that he is not a great person. And once he recognizes that, he's able to overcome his predicaments and so if i want to achieve that ending and i want to keep the size and scope of the story relatively the same because it's easy to just like add pages upon pages to fix things but it's harder to trim things into a neat box right let's try and do that if i wanted to do that i'd need a very succinct introduction that would happen before Rizzo and Evan meet and start making out. We need to, we need some, we need a few, few ground rules here. There's another thing is Prima never goes about explaining how they got to that point, but that's a whole other problem. But yeah, the makeout scene probably would work as a good inciting incident to introduce Evan and Rizzo. That might be a good inciting incident. I think I'll work with that as kind of our starting point. And so if I'm if I'm writing out a script or at least like a rough idea of one, I think what I'd want to do is I'd include some sort of prologue, but we're not talking about prologues, so ignore that. But I would want a prologue that kind of sets up the world, or at least the big magical world, maybe. I'm not sure. I'd have to think about it, but I think it needs some sort of prologue. But focusing on the introductory scene, in a new opening scene, I would want Evan and Ramona to interact. And so Ramona's like his neck mouth because he has a mouth on his neck. Um, I think I'd want them to interact because in doing so, I would introduce kind of that he is cursed. There'd be a lot of intrigue involved in this and I would be able to flesh out his character 
through um, having a back and forth between him and Ramona because Ramona is going to be the character who doesn't need the plot explained to her because she's already involved in it. Okay, this is actually easier if I just take the time to write it out. Oh my god. I've taken some time to write out a rough kind of script idea. Still don't think it's perfect, like especially because I'm the only one who's ever looked at it until now. And having reader feedback goes so far, and even without reader's feedback, like having some time away from a piece also goes a really long way. But like I, I'll talk to you guys a bit about like my process of rewriting this and my decision making. And the scene that I ended up writing, I still feel like it goes too quickly into things. I think it at least narrows down some of the things that we're introducing in a little less overwhelming way. There's still going to be some amount of overwhelm because Pretty Mouth kind of is a bit of an overwhelming concept to get across. So in this new introductory scene, I chose to start with a conversation between Evan and Ramona. So Ramona is like this mouth that he has on his neck. And when it comes to introducing Ramona as a character, I wanted it to happen very quickly. I didn't want to open on a shot of it, but I wanted to very quickly get into the fact that Evan is cursed and that he has a neck mouth, okay? Because a lot of what Pretty Mouth is about is figuring out how we got to this point. Um, a lot of it isn't revealed until later. There's some amount of mystery to it. So in a way that is kind of a plot, finding out what happened. So I wanted to preserve some of that. While like it's similar in the original opening, I don't like it as much because there's so much going on. And, and like I said, like when you add so much crazy stuff, so much weird stuff, it just kind of becomes blase. So I decided to fix fixate on a single weird thing and that is Ramona. Like, that's the only intriguing thing that I'm kind of allowing at this point. Like, I don't even bring up Hal because, like, Evan is more cursed than that. But like with Rose Heart, it's something that I can kind of keep to myself for now. It isn't needed and it textually can be fine because a lot of the time Hal doesn't do anything. And like, I added a little bit more intrigue, I think, in mentions of like, witches and Ira's name and curses. Like with Ro, like Evan shuts it down very quickly. Also like with Ro, I think it adds to what is trying to be gotten across. Um, like Evan doesn't want to deal with things. He's kind of self-centered and he only cares about his own thing. And in shutting Ramona down, that gets that across while also having some hints at the future uh, plot stuff. As for flavor, I add that a bit in the text messages and a little bit of like how he came to meet Rizzo. I haven't fully settled on how I want Evan to have met Rizzo because I don't really think it makes sense that Ali set them up because as we're gonna set up in the next scene that I wrote, like Rizzo isn't likable within world. Outside of world, I love him. Everyone loves him we're all Rizzo stands. Yeah, so for the next scene, I also wanted to set Rizzo up separately before the two of them interact. And I really struggled trying to think of a way to introduce Rizzo because he's a very quiet character. So I thought a great way to do that would be if I tied in the original prologue because in the original prologue for Pretty Mouth, Silver is attacked by an elder god that turns out to be Rizzo's dad. And I don't like it as an opener because a lot of people don't realize that it's Silver because it's a very long time before you see her again and she's never established much aside from waiting at a bus stop. I don't find that very interesting and I don't find it to be something that builds nicely off of itself. So in my rewrite, I decided to put those two things together because I thought it would be a good way to bring in Rizzo's sweet side, I guess. Um, so in my rewrite, I have Rizzo observing an interaction between Silver and some other classmates of hers. And I thought it would be kind of a good 
foreshadow or like just a building of his character because he was bullied so I thought it would be a good parallel I guess to bring them together so he witnesses a scene of them bullying her kind of there's some intrigue built up around the forest stop where Rizzo's dad can be found basically and some obvious intrigue gets thrown in there Rizzo has a bit of a conflict here of like whether to like help these this girl out or whether or not he should disappoint like Evan by not showing up I just I just thought that was good and I think it builds him up as a sweetheart but like I also thought it'd be a good idea to have him in a crowd and be able to like show how people keep their distance from him I think from there I would like try and build towards the initial inciting incident that um, the original Pretty Mouse opens with, but I think there's still a little bit in between that's missing that I'd have to figure out, and maybe I will figure it out for a video on inciting incidents, but that's a little about how I would deal with Pretty Mouse. Alright, moving on to the sequel of Pretty Mouse. The, the the better pretty mouth the magpie for those not in the know is a comic about a teenage girl trapped in a town and the elder god yes the elder god responsible is in love with her that's that's the basic just like with honey walls and with pretty mouth it starts with a prologue and again it is the type of prologue that i'll talk about at another date i do find that the magpie iteration of it is a bit more different, a bit more fleshed out and related. Uh, but again, another day, another time. I'm going to say that every single time because I do a lot of these. Instead, we're going to skip ahead to what is episode 7 of the webtoon or tapas version. So I like a lot of the first scene in concept but I don't really love the execution. I find that Magpie is kind of middling as far as execution goes across the board. Not my best work, but definitely passable, I would say. It still has this kind of thing where I start too early, which is a habit that I need to break, I guess. Or maybe I have broken. You know what? Never mind. Anyways, what happens with the magpie is that I begin the story with way too little setup and then I spend most of my later scenes trying to explain what happens. Like the thing about magpie is that it has a much bigger scope than both pretty mouth and honey walls and it needs a lot more setup and pretty mouth already needed setup so there you go. That said I don't really want to rewrite the script because it's something I'm currently actually working on, and that is a recipe for disaster, unlike with Pretty Mouth, which I never, ever am going to do again, okay? But instead of really digging into what I do have, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I would change, because the way that Pretty- the way that Magpie starts currently is that we get a short scene of Amanda trying to leave Pinewood and failing and then she meets the new kid at school waking up in class because she was snoozing and then she kind of slowly explains how we how we got to where we are what's going on to Trixie the new girl and that's that's kind of a, a fine basic setup it's a good way to get things across but it isn't executed well so if I was going to do this over again, the very first scene where she's attempting to leave Pinewood, I would want to better establish motive. Like, I might want to show the attempt to leave within the context of already knowing who she is and what she's trying to achieve. Because with some little more invested stakes, I could make that initial scene do double duty. One way I probably would have this go about is maybe have um, uh, her dad leaving the house during like an argument or something to kind of set up his character. And also the initial prologue is about Dennis as a kid and a lot of people don't make that connection because it takes a while before we come back to Dennis. So I'd love to just flash forward to him, really connect it solidly, and connect him to our main character really fast, and also set up Margie a little bit more, and just 
Amanda's general home life because Amanda is very important. And from that point, I would go into the Trixie introduction and I'd have a lot less baggage that I need to unpack <laughs> before actually getting into the story. Right now, like the lead up is just way too thin. So again, I end up spending like half of the story just kind of making up for that fact. And as such, like volume one is known for being uh, more confusing than later bits of Magpie. And some people will counter that and say that Magpie is like interesting because it's mysterious and confusing, but like I think it just goes way too far in the confusing category personally. Yeah, so that's all I have to say about Magpie because it is kind of like something I'm still working at um, and it's one of my most imperfect current works, I think. The next work I want to get into is my other current comic writing project and it's definitely my most recently written introduction and that's The Scourge of Nine Point and it has my most passable introduction. I'm still a little iffy on it because I'll always be super self-critical about these things. You you can't stop yourself. I'm mostly iffy on like the order and some of the execution, but I think it does set up pretty well. I think what's interesting about Scourge of Nine Point is that I'm not even completely through the actual introduction for the story. Like this kind of goes to show like how things balloon the more characters you add because Nine Point has an insane amount of characters. It's meant to be a nine volume series if I ever live long enough to see it finished. Regardless of that, like because of the length, the introduction is reflective of that. Uh, when I sat down to create this story, I like took I took to thinking in arches and I don't actually tend to think in arches when I'm doing um, the magpie volumes and breaking those up because I mostly break those up on size, but with nine point that wasn't the case and I'm going to truncate that and leave that for another day, but I broke the volumes up into different sections of a larger arching arch and like all of that is to say that the first 300 pages are the introduction. And that's very different compared to my other works. There's still a lot of plot that goes into uh, the first book in the form of sub arches. And as I've said, it's always going to be like arches within arches within arches. I'm saying arches now. I, I was saying arcs before, wasn't I? You know, same, same thing. So I'm going to focus on issue one, though issue two is, again, predominantly introduction and in the grander s scheme of things it is introduction another thing unlike my other stories is that the nine point prologue which is the first issue actually directly flows into the story and it's not my other weird type of prologue so we're actually going to get into it nine point has a lot of major time skips that go throughout the series like I wanted it to follow the characters as they grow up so a jump in time like that is telling of how the story is going to continue to progress rather than it being sort of like um, a one-off thing that happens just for the prologue. So the very first scene in Nine Point is of one of the main characters Mitzi and she's in class and she's answering a question about calicos um, and her answer then sets up a little bit about the world we're in but it mostly is about setting up Mitzi as a character like I am 100% certain that the lesson on souls which is being discussed isn't an effective choice of sharing information detailed information like that it's it's secondary and it's for the nerds who want to go back and read it but I don't expect most readers to gain a full understanding, even if I write a full understanding down. And so like, I know that the framing of this ends up making it look like this first scene is about getting across like souls and the lessons on there, but that's not actually my primary intent. Uh, when you like add a lot of fa fancy technical world building, again, or like magic, system information 
again, that's like for the nerds to comb through, the book nerds, but with your general audience, with my general audience, the goal was to serve as kind of a primer for future world building and future explanation. Like it's not required to understand what is coming up going forward. When this stuff is required, I'm going to set it up in a much more substantive kind of way. The goal is instead to introduce Mitzi and where she exists within the context of this magical world. So like thinking about that, like what do we learn about Mitzi in this scene? So first and foremost, she is a kitten that is learning to be a knight. She's very excited about it and she's super naive and uncritical of the world that she lives in. Uh, there's a bit of intrigue uh, thrown in in sort of like how she imagines the world from her point of view like from a reader's context like I hope I hope that a knight killing a kitten isn't like a cool aspirational thing for you as it is for Mitzi however the characters in the scene act like this is a normal thing okay so it sets up that thing where like intrigue is dismissed naturally and the fact that it's unnatural to just dismiss something like that for us. It sets up that this is the commonplace for the world that we're in. Like the idea of killing a calico initially might suggest to the readers like an adult knight, like knights fighting knights, but instead we we, we go straight to baby. <laughs> like why is that? What's going on the in this world? Intrigue, amazing. The following scene is then a lot of flavor. It centers around Penny, a raccoon lady who goes to the market and she finds out that Dusty the Coyote has a calico kitten that he is selling and she buys it. So this scene establishes the characters of Penny and Dusty. It explains how Marble the calico kitten and my YouTube icon, <laughs> Avatar, is that what it is? Uh, it, it shows how he came to end up living in a forest full of raccoons. And something I notice about kind of like the lengthier scenes I write is they tend to be a lot more filled with like just flavor text. When it's something simple to get across like this, it is then a great place to add a lot of extra bits and just flesh things out and write some cool dialogue. <laughs> And, and that's kind of what happens with this scene. And like generally kind of what my goal is for adding to this scene is I want to add that flavor of like what the wildlands is and introduce the fact that like all sorts of different like animal furry critters exist in the world and it kind of it ends up avoiding that issue I have in the magpie where I have to spend so much of my future explaining things especially the part where we just straight up show like how marble came to live in the forest with all of these animals and stuff and to already have it established that that's weird and that it's strange for a kitten to be growing up there that's actually kind of like a really common trope uh for good reasons because it's a very good storytelling de device is to show how your normal character ended up in an abnormal world <laughs> the only one i can think of off the top of my head is from elf <laughs> Like how, how did, how did baby come to grow up with elves? That's the first scene. We figure that out, but others exist. And this is exactly why I talk about my own stories because I am not a good consumer of media. All right. So our final scene is very similar. Uh, it introduces the king and queen of nine point and they're worrying over their daughter's eye color and what they will be. Do we know why they're worried? No, that's the intrigue that will be answered in future issues. It's just kind of the framework on which we introduce the king and queen. But in a lot of ways, it's also how we set up the character of Lace, who is baby right now. But we still learn about her, like Princess Lace as a character, which is further reintroduced in later scenes. Like, she has very little agency in her life. She's deaf. And most of the time, like, her input isn't considered. That's kind of a slight flavor thing that happens here, where her scenes are more focused around, more focused around, like, other 
people's stories. But the scene, regardless, is about setting up lace, her parents, and her place in the story. You know, she's a princess, and her blue eyes are upsetting for some reason. And that is what is set up, and it is succinct. Yeah, like, Nine Point has a lot to get across, and I think it is pretty strong in how it introduces these concepts early on. Okay, last but not least, we have my novel that we will be getting into, which is The Books of Avo, and it is currently on pre-order right now. However, there is an excerpt, excerpt? <laughs> I don't know how you say that, an excerpt, um, which is available, so why not dig into it? So let's finish this deep dive with our final example. So, in terms of scope, The Books of Avo is second to nine point. The only difference is that it is a prose book and not a comic book, so that honestly makes things a little bit easier. It makes things a lot easier for the, the arm of Ursula Grey, my artist <laughs> slash wife. So The Books of Avo is a fantasy book and it has a much wider array of characters than Honeywalls, Magpie, and Pretty Mouth. Because of this, these plots are weaved together. Just like in issue one of Nine Point, we go in multiple different directions. We don't just stick with one character. The introduction for the books of Avo goes on till about chapter three, but there's still like a lot for us to dig into within the first chapter. It does have a prologue, which is excluded from the sample because it is one of the many prologues that I will not be talking about, unfortunately. It introduces my son Lul, but unfortunately we will have to wait for Ursula to finish her illustrations before you can read about my boy. <laughs> What we do get instead we, is, is three different scenes, two of which center Juliet, the main character of the book. In between those scenes is a side plot that features Aaron, who is another main character. I'm not sure if he's, he's the second main character to this. I'd have to think about that, but he is definitely part of the B plot, as it were. So, to summarize the first scene, it is a date with our main character, Juliet. We're not dating her. She is on a date with a fella, and we dig into a lot of her character. It's revealed that she has a plant growing in her ear, she owns an apartment, and she is renting that apartment out to an elf. The scene ends with her being informed that her parents are evicting her from her apartment and will be taking over like all the stuff that she's been working on for the past three years I guess. Again this is primarily about setting up Juliet as a character. It's most analogous to the scene with Dusty and Penny in Nine Point. It begins with a very succinct description that really sets up her character and then fleshes out from there. Like I chose specifically the framework of a date to display your character because it's fun for one like it's a fun setup which is always something you should be looking for but it also is very exemplary of where she is in her life so at the start of the scene it quickly sets up that she isn't happy with her lot in life she's being set up on all these dates by her mother and she's just not into it that's told to us and then we really get into the showing as she sits about on this boring date and her attention drifts and we are shown a glimpse of what her true interests are and where the, her true interests lie. So behind her, so behind her date, she can see a bunch of ladies and they are having a great time with shady character and that's like a major point of intrigue for the story but within the context of the scene it works great to establish Juliet as someone that has an interest in danger and women or as if we're framing it in like a, a positive light she has like an interest in adventure she wants to she wants a bigger life you know and in general we get a fair amount of intrigue but it's put away very naturally on her date. So Dawn, her date, knows about the man that she's looking at, providing us all sorts of new information. 
and he knows that he's trouble so he guides her away from that conversation and tries to get the date back on track and through doing that we continue to establish Juliet's character and we are able to pull away from the big interesting thing going on in the background. Uh, the conversation then turns to like her apartment. The conversation then turns to her apartment, the one that she manages. She she lives in one and manages another. It's confusing, I'm realizing. But yeah, as it turns to that part of the conversation, we can really springboard off of that idea and develop the fact that Juliet really likes her independence, but there's tension there, which is further applied when her date informs her that her parents are pulling the plug on that. This is a further iteration of the idea that Juliet has a life that is still largely under the control of her parents, and it doubles as some pressure that will lead the story to its inciting incident. So from that point, we get further intrigue and flavor as we learn what led to her parents pulling the plug. So Julius discusses how she's been renting her apartment to this elf, which is super cool to her, and she has run into some magical issues, the main one being that a sprout has started growing out of her ear. On her previous date, the information got out and reached her parents, hence the plug pulling on all of this and wanting to control her more again. So yeah, a lot of the scene is about like flavor and intrigue. It's a lot denser than Honey Walls because there is a lot more need to add that flavor. Like we're setting up a tone, a different setting, like a whole other magical world rather than just magical elements within our world. And, and that takes a lot more time. I wouldn't dedicate all of my efforts in one scene to any of these smaller elements, but they are, they are important to spread out throughout the story. So some of those minor things that like I want to include within the flavor is that this is a 1920s setting, so I want to use some slang, I want to use some noticeable tropes to put that across. I also really want to set up the idea that there's immortals in this world and, and fantasy races and that Juliet has an interest in those immortals since those are going to be like a major part of the story I really want to get into those and it's easy to get into those because Juliet kind of has an interest in them so the topic is natural to get into. I also really wanted to like start hinting at the concept of dragons but not dive directly into it right away because that is a big can of worms again. Keeping things more on the flavor side rather than so much spicy spicy intrigue. So that's that scene. The one that follows is a very brief scene and it's about Eren. So Aaron's searching through his master's letters before he comes home from a party or an outing or something. And amongst those letters, he finds a strange one that's written in a language he doesn't understand. And then he pockets it and skedaddles. So the reason that this is such a short scene, partly pace, and another part is kind of the reverse reason that Juliet's is so long. So Juliet is a human, right? And her main story, like her struggle with her parents, is a very understandable two cent kind of problem. Like it, it doesn't cost a lot to explain that. So there's lots of room to go about exploring the world and fleshing things out. Aaron, however, is an exiled angel who is living as a servant for some master fella and he is doing so to look through his things and and spy on him and he's doing this all at the behest of his elf friend so that's like not super relatable to most of us um maybe some of you it's literally describing your life for Aaron instead of focusing immediately on the internal world like I do with Juliet immediately focusing on her problems and how they relate to like her personality and whatnot like the first thing that I introduce about Aaron is that he is glowing <laughs> he he emits light from his skin he's a shiny boy skin of skin of a killer Bella so I do that to sort of set up that he's an angel but I don't lead with um telling on that front I lead with showing 
And the reason that I do that is if you tell, if I were to tell you guys that he's an angel, there's a bunch of like pre-baked elements in what an angel is, but these are my own homebrew angels and they're different. <laughs> so I don't want you to immediately have all these ideas because then I have to spend all this time like dispelling those. If I was to do like the other thing where I lead with his personality and mention the angel stuff, the angel stuff later, I then have to dispel the ideas that people build up in their head that he's an average human person who doesn't glow sparkle. That's why we begin instead with Aaron uh, stumbling around in the darkness, uh, despite the fact that his skin is glowing. So it, it sets a little bit about his character. There's a bit, there's a bit of flavor to that. It's, it's a little flavored by, by, by Aaron's personality, but the main thing I get across is that he is a glowing boy, and I think that's a good lead-in. It's a good middle ground. And after that point, that's when I flesh him out a little more as a character and his relationship uh, to his master and living as a servant. Like, I want to get into that because that's the bulk of of his story especially at the beginning those are like the most important things to get across the further fleshing out of his character as an angel and actually mentioning that that's more in the pile of intrigue right so aaron is searching through the letters on his master's desk and he finds one that's addressed to his angel name. And that's where I give kind of a pretty definitive say that he is an angel. I used the word angelic for the first time. That comes after um, introducing him as a glowy boy and introducing like his job and circumstances. There's some further kind of intrigue added into like what it means to be an angel and what is going on for him as a character as it mentions that the letter that's addressed to him is from his grandmother and his grandmother is under house arrest interesting but we need to set it aside right now because aaron has a job to do he's looking through letters and he sees a very strange one which is far more intriguing so we move away from his past life and we go right into that and we don't need to do anything from there because that is our, our cliffhanger. So we don't need to dispel it naturally. It's the lead in for our next scene with him, hopefully. We don't know. We only have chapter one. I don't know what happens. Anyways, back to Juliet. So our follow up scene with Juliet is one of our scene sequels and it ends with a punchy hook that is much more intriguing, I think, than her first scenes ending hence the reason why i like wanted it to end my first chapter because it leads in better to like a chapter two i think because it introduces some more fantastical issues in her life rather than just her uh fiscal issues and family issues it, it, we, we get into dragons here basically <laughs> The scene begins with her returning to her apartment and finding it's cleared out. She reflects on her feelings about this, like her life, the date. We, we get a, a, a chunk of flavor as she describes the city view that she has outside her window. Like we get to see that there's a castle. I think that's the first time that's mentioned. And she compares herself to an angel looking down from the star. So we get some more, more flavor, some more interest about angels and she also mentions that there are wannabe dragons mingling about as well and then it all ends with, with a dragon showing up so that's that scene and all of those things are like slowly stacking concepts that like i want to slowly add and slowly layer like adding elements in this way so that they begin to feel natural is important. If you ease into things, if you set up your world, things that would otherwise be intrigue and distracting then just become flavor because they end up like just enhancing what you already have rather than feeling 
out of the blue and odd and you want your world to start feeling natural and lived in so that you can start adding intrigue bits to put it another way like i don't want people to be surprised when they see an angel i want them to be surprised um when something explodes <laughs> <laughs> or I don't want people to be surprised when they see an angel. I want them to be surprised when an angel does something that an angel shouldn't do because they're steeped in the world and they understand what things are and how they work so that when things change, they're exciting. When things are status quo, they're interesting but not ground shattering. Anyways, the scene ends with a dragon showing up and I think that's pretty cool. Hot damn, dragons are cool, so... End your scene with dragons. That is the moral of the story. Uh, I think we're good and golden. Uh, you guys are perfectly prepared. So that is how I go about structuring the first scenes, the introduction. It's just one of those things that's like surprisingly complex in its simplicity. You want it to feel so simple but there's a lot of work that goes into like determining these things like you really want to sit down when you write i guess you can stand up but you really want to like think about what is important what is the purpose what needs to be set up how do i make it interesting like what is a good setting to convey this information what is a good situation that'll be both like interesting and plotful eventful but not too eventful that you can't introduce anything and you can't build off of it like it feels so simple when you read it done well but actually sitting down and honing what is needed is very difficult and requires like a lot of thought in either like your initial production or in your future edits usually in your future edits because it's very very difficult to look at something and determine how it begins when you have no idea how it ends and you might think that it will end a certain way but it ends up ending a different way like it's just it's impossible to do this without knowing what continues off of this point like i've read a lot of your initial scenes your initial uh chapters when i've done uh script reviewing for the critique stream and a lot of the times like i can come up with a lot of ideas and suggestions however I'll go on to your second chapters, your third chapters, and I can very quickly realize that what was set up in chapter one is like not correct for what you are doing. Like it becomes mismatched. So if you really focus constantly on the introduction without looking forward, without seeing what your introduction actually requires, like you're gonna end up with something beautiful but doesn't match. That is just another part of it. So I wish you well on all of those things. I don't know how to conclude this thing on introductions. Uh, thank you for watching. Oh, I know, I know. Like, comment, and subscribe, I guess. I'm always surprised when I look at your little, little avatars and I see that you guys aren't subscribed. I'm like, I see you all the time. What are you doing? Everyone just hangs out in their home feed, am I right? I'm one of those guys now. Ugh. Make sure to check your subscriptions from time to time, guys. Um, remember people that exist. I don't know. What, what, what are we going on about? Uh, I'll see you in the next video. I have the beginnings of a script that I'm working on, so uh, I don't think it'll be as long as this one, but I'm certain that others will be <laughs> this long, um, especially on concepts of writing. All right, bye.